get started. Uh, we are delighted to have Ambassador Yucca Rashvili from Georgia with us today. We've had to reschedule this meeting several times, but you know, the anticipation will make it even better. So we're delighted to have you here. Uh, so um, he's currently the ambassador of Georgia to the United States. Um, uh, ambassador Yucca Rashvili joined the Georgian Foreign Ministry in 1991. And he held a number of different positions there, including um, as director, I think, uh, of the Department of the USA, uh, Canada, and Latin America. Um, his previous position was serving as the Deputy Prime Minister and State Minister for Reintegration in the Georgian government, where he dealt with Sasha Sesha Abkhazia and all of these issues uh, prior to coming here. Uh, but he also has had a distinguished think tank career while serving in the uh, foreign Ministry. He has been, he was the co-founder and executive vice president of the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies, which is a preeminent think tank in that part of the world. Um, I myself have attended a conference there. It's very, very impressive people there, training young people as well. Um, and he has also been a visiting researcher uh, in the Silk Road Study Center at the University of Uppsala. Um, today, I know your official talk is going to be on uh, uh, the Jews of Georgia, the traditions, the history, and I'm sure any other things that people want to ask you about in the question and answer period, you'll be very willing to answer. So thank you very much for coming, and we're delighted. Thank you very much, and I will start by apologizing for uh, rescheduling this meeting several times. And, uh, ambassador's uh, life is not always uh, in the hands of ambassador. Mostly it's in the hand of, uh, in hands of wife of ambassador, but sometimes in the <laughs> government uh, that uh, he represents. Uh, the reason was government, not my wife. Um, I'll be ambassador in another two days, and then I'm resigning. Uh, and I will rejoin the think tank, this time in the US, uh, to reflect about my sins. <laughs> in, um, in, in, during my career, I had a lot of opportunities to speak to people and on a variety of subjects. And I have to admit that the, the most difficult one that I ever had was to talk with a, a mid school, the Jewish mid school kids. <coughs> because you don't know what they will be asking, and you don't want to look childish, you don't want to be over you know, oldish because they're still kids, and they're Jewish and they're smart. And they Googled you the day before. <laughs> uh, I survived that audience, so I'm pretty sure that I can handle educated audience like yours today. And when we are talking about the subject of Georgian Jews, uh, you know, it's the part of the world that um, is any other part of the world. It's full of mythology. So first of all, it's very difficult to really understand where mythology merges the reality and when they you know, go in parallel or when they reflect some uh, real events that happen, but nevertheless, uh, you know, there is a certain narrative already in place that uh, I'll be happy to repeat about Jews in Georgia. I don't know how much you know about Georgia itself, but uh, probably it will be helpful to say that uh, we can go as far as in history, as far as first humanoids. Apparently, National Geographic discovered that some um, historic uh, evidences, some bones that were excavated in Georgia, challenged out of Africa theory that the humanoids first inhabited the Eurasian continent as well as Africa. So our bones are at least the same age as Africa, if not older. So when we talk about Georgian history, we can go back to those that look like monkey, not my ancestors. Um, but uh, at the same time, we are talking about a country that has 3,000 years of statehood. Again, statehood not in a modern 
nation state kind of uh, meaning, but whatever states, city states, uh, the kingdoms existed in those periods of time existed in Georgia already. This is one of the earliest uh, Christian countries. Georgia adopted Christianity as a state religion in uh, 337 AC. Pretty early. And we know about Jews of Georgia actually from Georgia, mostly from Georgian Christian sources. And surprisingly, uh, these two stories are very much intertwined. So what we discover in Georgian sources is that Jews first came to Georgia after the destruction of the First Temple, which means 26 centuries ago. <coughs> there are some scholars who speculate that you know Georgians are one of the most tense tribes of Jews, but you know I'll leave it to speculation. Uh, but evidences of that we have already in the Georgian manuscripts that. Uh, Jews came to Georgia after the destruction of the First Temple, and there is a pretty well narrated story that they came to a specific city, the, the type of capital of Georgia, Tzcheta. They met the local governor and they asked to rent them a place for living. And he rented them some dwelling space in some place called Zana. Now, that's a story. Uh, recent archaeological excavations actually discovered old Jewish graves, not 26 centuries ago, but you know, more 11th century kind of discoveries that those areas really were inhabited by Jews. And uh, the most recent finding was a wonderful golden bracelet with a Hebrew script on it. Um, so, First documented Jewish arrival in Georgia is 26 centuries ago. So it's after Nabuchodonosor. Yeah, I have 20 Machshem over there. And since that, obviously, the community has developed in many different ways according to the development of the place itself. So now the basic question that people are asking, are you Sephardic or Ashkenazi? The real answer is none of them. We uh, are considered as Sephardic, but not really. Because you know that Sephardic is a faith. So the Sephardim are the Jews who came from Spain. We didn't come from Spain, we came from Jerusalem. But traditions, or as uh, people call it in Hebrew, Nusach, the style of prayer, is Sephardic. Nevertheless, in specific prayers, and the very important ones, like um, Amidah, Shmonai, with the 18th prayer, it's completely different in the Georgian Jewish case than either Ashkenazi or Sephardic tradition. You know that the uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazi tradition, they differ, the Georgian Jewish is completely different. Why? Again, I don't know. But uh, <coughs> that's the reality. Going back to Jewish history, um, apparently, why we know uh, a lot about Jews in Georgia? Because of the Christianity story of Georgia. And the story goes like um, there were two brothers. Uh, their names in Georgian scripts are Elios and Longinos. Most likely it was a Elia and something else. They apparently traveled to Jerusalem to participate in the gathering of Sinedrian or Sanhedrin, uh, who would make a decision on Jesus. So if this story tells you that the community was strong enough that it was represented by two members. We are talking about 120 members in total, right? So this, that's a synergy, like method to this. So 
unlike the Washingtonians, taxation without representation, uh, Georgian Jews, I don't know if they were paying taxes, but they were represented as a community apparently in Jerusalem, in Sinedrion of that time. And the story goes that this Elios and Longinos, they traveled to Jerusalem, but by the time that they arrived, Jesus was already crucified. So um, Elios managed to get a piece of the clothes of Jesus, the blood of And they came back home. And they came back home, sister of Elios, Sidonia, her name. Sidonia was, she saw the blooded piece of clothes and she understood that Jesus was dead and she grabbed that clothes and she died too. And they buried her together with this old piece. Uh, and that's a Georgian story. And the Georgian story continues that on that particular place, you know, we, uh, on the grave of Sidonia, we had a tree, and the tree was uh, you know, saturated with uh, uh, some kind of moisture that was healing moisture. And they called this tree Pillar of Life in Georgia called Svetis Hobet. And today, you will, if you go to Georgia, you'll find a wonderful monastery uh, built in the 11th century in that place. It's called Svetis Hobet, the Pillar of Life. So then you have a Jewish family. It's supposed to be a, a personal tragedy of one family, giving ground to Christianity in Georgia. Uh, so because of that family, Georgians already claimed that at least some holy pieces, like blood of Jesus, is in By tradition, uh, Georgia was um, uh, considered as a place for Mother Mary to preach Christianity. You remember that the apostles and Mother Mary divided uh, the world to go and preach, and uh, apparently Georgia was considered part for the Mother Mary, and Georgians are very proud of it. Uh, but uh, apparently she was not feeling well physically, so then two apostles came to Georgia to preach, it was Andrew and uh, Simon. Simon, thank you. Um, so they came, they preached, they left. What happened in the third century, then you have a story of Saint Nin. Again, uh, Saint Nina came from Cappadocia, it's a current Turkey. She was preaching Christianity, and according to Georgian sources, the first place that she went and found the sympathetic ear was in synagogue. And uh, that time, Jews were re referred as <coughs> Kuria, Uriah. And Jews got a very strange name as well. In Georgian, it sounds Huriani Kartwenda. Jews of Georgians. It was not, you know, Jews, just, you know, Jewish, just <coughs> other nation. But Jews of Georgians. So it's something that belongs to you. It belongs to place. It's not considered alien. It's considered one of. Slightly different, but again, one. So Saint Nina actually uh, came and preached the first time about the Christianity and the ideas of Christianity in synagogue. Because she claimed that the other people were so much uh, ignorant and they were worshipping uh, you know, fires and uh, nature and uh, uh, you know, trees and something else. And the paganistic religions were very popular. And she said that the only place that I could preach my Christianity was China. And apparently, according to the same story, the first priest of Georgia, Abiatar, which is a very much Jewish name, uh, was true. It was a kind of rabbi. So <coughs> what form of Christianity we are talking that time, God knows. Which God? One God. But uh, 
nevertheless, you see that entire story of development of Christianity in Georgia is very much linked with um, uh, uh, Jews that used to live and still live in Georgia, which places them in a special place in Georgian kind of national development. On top of that, you had since uh, fourth century uh, family of Bagration being a royal family of Georgia, or the same part of the family Bagrationis were ruling Armenia. So Bagrationis claimed that Georgia royal family comes from King David. And there was something that they were proud of. So here you have the two sources of legitimacy, one religious and one royal. And both of them claim roots to Jerusalem, both of them claim roots to Jews. And third, very practical part was the uh, fact that Georgia was on the crossroads of east and west, was part of the ancient Silk Road, which included a lot of trade. And, you know, guess what? Jews were all around. And in most of the Georgian king's cases, the kind of ministers of economy or finance or trade were largely Jews. <coughs> when uh, Georgian kings had um, something important to deliver, they were using Jews. When they uh, had to bring the groom or bride, they were using uh, Jews. Uh, and uh, that factor that that particular ethnicity was also very useful in the, for the state development, created a very interesting environment that Georgia became a place where Jews were very comfortable. One of the few places in the world that there was no anti-Semitism. And even during the Russian Empire, when the Russians started to import uh, anti-Semitism, Georgian intelligentsia resisted very strong. And there are many cases of it. So going back to history, um, you have to little bit look at the world from Georgian perspective. And the world looked completely different up to 15th century. Up to 15th century, actually, gravity or places of gravitation were not in Europe. There were some Italian cities developing in the Mediterranean, Genoa and uh, you know, little policies that were created. Um, there were some reminiscence of previous empires, Byzantine Roman Empire, which was again in the south of Europe. <coughs> Big part of the intellectual development was happening in the East, was happening in what we call today Persia or Iran. Um, Turks and Seljuks managed to then start to uh, spread more and more in the region. Obviously, all other empires that were fighting each other were kind of south of Georgia, either east, either south, or <laughs> that vicinity. There was nothing north. There was no Northern Europe. There was no Russia in the forms that would matter. So center of gravity was pretty much in the east, south, east, and east. And you see interaction of Georgian Jews with the, those parts of the world. And it was very interestingly reflected later because we find a lot of interesting materials in Persian sources about Jews in Georgia. And we recently discovered that uh, in Tbilisi in the 11th century, you had a very strange Jewish sect called Tiflisids, 
who are vegetarian. For what reason? I don't know. But they are veg Jews, but vegetarian. Apparently, Georgia was also inhabited by a sect of Karaims. You heard about Karaims, right? The Karaims are those Jews who only believe in uh, um, Torah and five books of Moses, and they don't recognize Talmud as an obligatory book because it's not given by God, it's written by people. So the Karaims were very much into the Jewish, uh, in the Hebrew and the Hebrew literature and Hebrew grammar and the famous Karaim Trakta uh, in the Hebrew grammar was written in a place called Gagra, the country is occupied by Russia, but it's in Georgian territory. So you see a lot of interaction between Jews from other places in Georgia. And apparently in the 19th century, we had four kinds of Jewish communities only in Tbilisi. Georgian Jews, Mountainian Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, and Persian Jews. And all four had their own synagogues. And more than that, even today in Azerbaijan, you have a Georgian Jewish synagogue, which tells you that these Jews were very funny. I mean, they were not kind of adopting to the place. They were taking their sort of Jewishness somewhere else and having their synagogue and others that they don't go to. <laughs> but uh, Persian stories uh, and Persian literature is full of stories about Jews in Georgia. And uh, I have, I have it in Georgia. I have photos from the Shah's archive. When photography was invented, the Russian Tsar traveled to Persia. And as a gift, he presented to Shah photos, black and white photos. Uh, and it was considered as a very serious gift. You know? And uh, there are 32 photos in the entire collection. Two of them are of Georgian Jews. So our ambassador made the copies of them and sent them in. Uh, yeah, Georgian Jews look like Georgians, actually. Uh, they dress like Georgians. The only difference that you will notice are the faces. Not uh, as elaborate as, you know, today, you know, these really round ones, but you can see that they it's curvy, little bit curvy. So it's still uh, uh, an ample opportunity to discover <coughs> stories of Georgian Jews in Persian sources. For understandable reasons, we don't have much of the access today. But one day I hope, uh, I hope it will not take another Argo and the Moscow to <laughs> solve the problem there. But um, nevertheless, it's an uh, untapped source of uh, the now, Georgian Jews are distinct also in two very specific areas. Food, and you have to believe that there is a Georgian Jewish food that nobody else has in the world. There are dishes that nobody else in the world cooks. They look similar to some other uh, things, but it's uniquely Georgian Jewish. No other, and the gefilte fish we know, okay? But uh, you don't know what's chenak. Nobody, even Georgians don't make it, okay? And uh, it's disappearing tradition. I think somebody <coughs> should take a serious uh, uh, look at that and to document these dishes because there are fewer people who remember how to make it. And second is, uh, so-called niguni, songs, religious songs that you sing during the prayer. Not only chazan uh, things, but also the congregation. Very different from anything else that you will encounter 
in the world. Very distinct. And, um, you know, when you listen to it, it's an oriental tradition, when it sounds like oriental songs. But melody is completely different. I mean, you will recognize it's a Jewish melody because it's a matter of suffering and <laughs> all of that. But um, different sounds and different tradition of singing. At the same time, uh, you will see that in certain periods of time, community was getting into serious trouble. Number of community was shrinking, number of rabbis were getting scarce, and uh, apparently community was organizing itself uh, very seriously and inviting other rabbis when they need it. And there comes the story of Ashkenazi Jews in Georgia. Apparently, uh, community leaders always have kept uh, relations with the Jerusalem and Holy Land. And for whatever reasons, Georgian Jews were always very Zionistic very much believers in scientific ideas. So uh, in, in Jerusalem, you can find entire quarters that were uh, called Gurjis. Gurji is the name of Georgia, Gurjistan. Georgians were called Gurjis. And in a 17th, 18th, 19th century, Georgian Jews were traveling and settling in Jerusalem. And uh, I met one guy who, whose great-great-grandfather came from Georgia and basically owned you know, one quarter of Jerusalem. <laughs> and there were specific quarters that were inhabited by Georgian Jews. Of course, now it's all gone and it's all mixed and they are very much already adopted to the place. But there was always a spiritual link, and there was always a kind of a pilgrimage that Jews were going there, and some of them were going and living there. But in some cases, when there was a trouble in the Middle East and in Palestine, then Georgian Jews started to look in a different direction. They started to look on the European direction. And we know about two rabbis that came to Georgia in the 19th century and stayed there, the 20th century. Uh, it's a rabbi Huales, um, uh, who, I don't know if you know Dan Mariashin. It's his grandfather. Rabbi Kupchan, if you know brothers Kupchan's here, yes. it's one of them is their grandfather. If you know Rabbi Haikin, who was the chief rabbi of Europe and then he was chief rabbi of Ukraine, his father was born in Georgia and he was born in Georgia. Mother of current Rabbi Shemto here in Washington. His mother is from Kutaisi, Georgia. So you start to see rabbis being invited from the Ashkenazi community to serve in Georgia. Because uh, the connections with the Jerusalem are trouble, there are more troubles in the East, so Georgian Jewish community start to move in the West. And you know the Rabbi Hollis was the chief rabbi in Tzchidvali. But Tzchidvali in South Society, the capital of South Society, was an entirely Jewish city in the 19th century. Um, so this interaction started on that level by inviting rabbis. But then Georgia started to develop as a European country that needed a lot of um, Architecture, you know, 
canalizations and roads and other things. And you see the first wave of Ashkenazi Jews now coming in Georgia as a professionals. Not specifically Judaism, but professionals like the civilian professionals. My wife's grandfather came to Georgia to build roads. He came with his family, he was religious and all of that. So he stayed in So then you see the second wave of Ashkenazi Jews coming. And the third wave was actually during the Tsarist Russia, when, um, you know, how is it with Chirtah Sedlis? Chirtah Sedlis, the Jews could not live where they wanted to live. Oh, the Paris settlement. The Paris settlement. Yeah. They had <clears throat> that kind of thing in the Russian Tsarist Empire, but not in Georgia. Georgia was part of Russian Empire, but Jews in Georgia were free to move. So a lot of Ashkenazi Jews found it very useful to move to Georgia because they were not subject of that whatever rules that uh, the Russian Tsars in, in the imposed. And last wave was um, after uh, the Second World War. And many of people uh, could not find comfortable to live in other places they came to Georgia, to Georgia and Azerbaijan. And they started to interact with locals. And uh, as I mentioned, the locals were already Georgian Jews, Persian Jews, who were coming for trade reasons, and uh, mountainous Jews who were coming from Narchip, who were coming from northern Azerbaijan, and those kind of places. And the community became very diverse. Again, Georgian Jews being the big part of it. But um, nevertheless, uh, having one faith and one interaction among each other. Which lasted very nicely for a very long period of time before Soviets came. And again, during the Soviet Union, Georgians managed to be distinct from any other republics. And even in the Soviet Union, Jews felt in Georgia much more comfortable than even Georgians. Because Georgian um, Orthodox Church was uh, swallowed by the Russian Orthodox Church in the 18th century, 19th century. But Georgian synagogues kind of were left alone to function, and they were always Functions even during the Soviet time. And we had many functioning synagogues in Georgia, not only the capital, but largely in the regions as well. And uh, they're supposed to be very grateful to the Soviet government, but immigration from Soviet Union to Israel started by very famous letter of. 18 Georgian Jewish families who wrote to then the Secretary General Brezhnev. And we are talking about 1965 or 66. At that time, it was uh, almost the heroes. And that letter triggered immigration of the Soviet Jewry to Israel because they were refused, they were arrested, and they went. Moscow and went on the hunger strike. And this was a very brave action that these people, uh, the 60s, I mean, come on, it's, it's a Soviet, Soviet Union, you know, it's commies. And they broke the uh, curse, and they were the first ones who managed to get out of the Soviet Union and immigrate to Israel. And there were several waves of immigration in 75, and later, or the after collapse of Soviet Union. And, uh, and nowadays, Georgian Jewish community is very small, probably from three to 5,000 people, minus one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you um, uh, mostly in the capital, Tbilisi. And there were places, you know, largely populated mm -hmm. by Jews, but they're all gone now. 
you'll find Georgian Jews largely in Israel, in specific cities like Ashdod and Ashkelon, why do you know? There is a small community in Austria. Uh, there is a pretty large community in Russia, in Ukraine, in uh, New York, in Queens. You have a Georgian Jewish synagogue together with Bukharian Jews. You know, they look like the same. Uh, and probably that's it. These are the more or less organized communities. And now we joined the globalized world, and we don't know how the globalized world is going to treat us, but uh, we do consider ourselves as a very integral part of the larger Jewish family and part of the, what Ashkenazi called Yiddish kind. I'll stop here, and I'll be glad to satisfy you. Thank you very much. That was really very interesting. So I think we're going to have lots of questions. Okay. I just want to field your own questions. Go ahead. Tell me what records exist of the Jewish Jewish records, you know, the birth records or the death records or whatever, of the Jews of Georgia. Do they exist in Georgia, and where are they? They exist in the different forms, and uh, obviously the most, um, you know, the written records are largely ketubah, right. the marriage contract. Right. We have in Georgia probably one of the oldest uh, you know, manuscripts, the Hamisha from Shei Torah of 11th century, Laila Bible, so-called, 11th century. I mean, nobody has it. Yeah. Um, so archaeological excavations of the graves and the personal items that have a Hebrew scripture on that. But you know, a birth certificate kind of thing was, uh, yeah. or that certificate, it's later. And it was uh, conducted by in the synagogues. The synagogues were the ones who were right. rabbis who were registering birth and who were registering death and who were registering the ketubah right. as well. So um, when it goes to Hebrew scripts we have as old as 10th and 11th century. But when it goes to documents, then we have a document that are already dated in 17th, 18th century in our archives. But in, in the state archives? Yes. And what about the Jewish cemeteries? Do they exist? Are they being they exist. Uh, uh, you know, in Jewish tradition, you know that if cemeteries disappear and you allow it to disappear, you don't fix it. Uh, it's not supposed to fix it. Um, uh, and uh, all these cemeteries, uh, obviously they exist. Some of them are functional. And um, in other cases, according to traditions, they just uh, they take the nature to take care of it. And you don't fix it. I was thinking, and, and I have one last question, and I'll stop. In Israel, the Georgian Jews are, have the reputation of being the strongest, most brave soldiers in the Israeli army. And they also have a reputation for being the criminals. I know that part, but I wanted to know, that part. <laughs> I wanted to know where this, this, this image of the fierce regime is, or however it comes from. It comes from Georgians, because Georgians are like that. Ah. And, and a lot of uh, cases, uh, Jews of Georgia are the same as Georgians. I mean, you will not see a distinction. Okay? okay. Everything that Georgians do, Jews do too. I mean, good things and bad things. And Georgians were always good warriors. Always. I don't know if you know, but a big part of Mamelukes were Georgians. Yeah. When you mentioned Chinook, which Hainagi. I probably, I'm sorry. Hainagi. You said it after the filter fish. Is it a fish dish? What's no, in it? No, it's not a. a we want to know about the dish. Yeah, let's go to food. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I'm not a producer, I'm a consumer. <laughs> so, uh, as far as I understand, there are some um, well nuts in it, eggs. It's, uh, 
I don't know how it's done. I'm eating it. It's, 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 it's a solid uh, food. It's not uh, soup. But it's, uh, you use the uh, chicken soup for it. But I don't know. I don't think it was Further internet research is warranted. Right. <laughs> Did the Jews experience anti-Semitism when Georgia was a part of Soviet Union? And also, how many Jews are left in uh, Georgia now? Uh, as I mentioned, not uh, at all. Actually, anti-Semitism uh, never took roots in Georgia. And currently, you know, it depends. If you are asking to organizations like Sokhnut and uh, JDC, there are 35,000. If you ask to somebody else, you will say 3,000. All these are the numbers. Um, did a lot of the um, Georgian Jews leave uh, when Russia started to allow, the Soviet Union started to allow Jews to leave and go to Israel or the United States? And if they did, um, explain, you, see, you said that they didn't suffer anti Semitism and they seem to be well integrated into the society, but nevertheless, it sounds like a good number of them took the opportunity and leave. You could just kind of elaborate on that. Yes, it was not about anti-Semitism, it was not about escaping the Soviet Union, Soviet life. Uh, it was not about escaping Georgia, and that's a very interesting that Georgian Jews were the worst uh, in absorption in Israel. They stayed in uh, very close communities. They basically created Georgian ghettos in Israel. And they kept Georgian language, they kept Georgian traditions, they kept everything. When others were eager to kind of forget about their country of origin, Georgians were doing completely opposite. Georgian Jews stayed Georgians in Israel and uh, had all these features that Georgians had. And uh, in one hand, it was nice culturally, but it was difficult for them because they were delaying absorptions in Israeli society. And uh, this ghettoization, uh, which is probably disappearing now, uh, was there. And you can see that they were dressing their kids in Georgian dresses, teaching them Georgian, singing in Georgian, and all of that. So they left for the political and economic reasons, not because of the anti-Semitists, and when they left, they kept all the traditions in Israel. Let's see, at the back there? Yeah. Yep. Um, so. I was wondering, I have a two-part question. Um, I know now that the Georgian government, um, especially the Ministry of the Diaspora, is trying very hard to reach out to the Georgian diaspora um, around the world, in Europe, and in the United States in particular. And I was wondering, um, to what extent they're also looking to reach out to the Georgian Jewish communities in, say, New York or in Belgium or uh, in Israel in particular, I guess, um, and what that outreach, ha what constitutes that outreach and what its goals are? And um, also, second part question, what do you think is the future of the Georgian Jewish community? Is there um, a kind of emergence of a new idea about, uh, you know, uh, returning to traditions or uh, uh, returning to uh, understanding that identity better or is intermarriage really uh, becoming an issue in terms of preserving uh, the Georgian Jewish community and its identity? These are two hard questions. Um, but um, one is easy to answer. Uh, I still don't know what exactly the Ministry of Diaspora should do. Because whatever I was uh, hearing from diaspora people, it's so irrelevant. But they were asking for Georgian books. But for God's sake, go to the internet and download as much as you want. You want the uh, Georgian movies? They are on YouTube. You want uh, Georgian TV? You have it in live streaming. You want to call in Georgia, two cents per minute, or Skype. So whatever was traditional problem of the diaspora, and for example, when my uncle 
left to Israel, I mean, it was, we knew that he was gone forever. We would never see him. Of course, now we can go and visit him anytime we want. And other members of family, but that time, it was forever. I mean, these people were gone. And you were pretty sure that, you know, in your lifetime, you would never see them anymore. But today, in the globalized world, whoever wants to stay close to Georgia, they can do it online. You buy a ticket for 200 bucks and go there. Okay? So, diasporas are not yet transitioned to that. When you still talk, oh, we want to keep... Uh, in our traditions, keep it. Or we want help from Georgia, what kind of help? Even, even Georgian textbooks are online and accessible. Oh, I want to buy for my kid a Georgian alphabet. It's a, okay, download it, you know. But you don't need a physical book anymore. Things are online and this globalization is a lot, a lot of possibilities for it. So, about the political participation, it's a very tricky issue. I don't know. Uh, some countries have good experiences, some countries have bad experiences. But nevertheless, I don't think that Georgians abroad, either Georgian Jews or Christian Georgians, are in the quantities that they will make a political difference in any country. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if there will be successful businessmen, successful doctors, successful lawyers, or whatever, it will be helpful for Georgia because they will be the agents of impact um, to Georgia as well. So, if the ministry is reaching out, I really have no idea. Last time I talked to former minister, I was telling him that you have to go and set up a uh, probably the web portal, and he did it actually, and it was most effective. You don't really need to uh, reach out in any other way. And the communities, if they want Georgian singers, they will invite. They do it constantly and they enjoy it. Now, future of Georgian Jews, I have no idea. In one hand, a uh, number of Jews in Georgia is reduced to very many. Uh, of course, some traditions will be kept in some families. But 100 years from now, I think Jews will be so much mixed uh, than uh, this distinction of the Georgian community. Or, uh, but I think the future is like the Ukrainian Jews. You have the shtetls there, and uh, all disappeared, and only you have it in, only in the books. The Odessian Jews from Odessa, and it was an entire world that you probably can read in the books of Babel, and that's it, they're gone. So, probably this distinction, Georgian Jew, the Russian Jew, Ukrainian Jew, will stay in books and will stay in Israeli politics. <laughs> in some form. And that's it. When the Jewish population was really thriving in Georgia, what regions did they predominantly inhabit? Uh, they were everywhere, basically everywhere, because um, there was not a specific developed place. They were pretty much uh, all <coughs> areas of Georgia, including the very harsh climate areas like the south of Georgia. Not only the seaside, but in, in South Ossetia, it's a cut for cotton place. Now we're in the mountain. They were there. Swanetti. In Swanetti, no. They were not in Swanetti. Hefsureti. Hefsureti is a very funny story. You know that uh, some people believe that it comes from what Hevis Uria, Jew of the mountain. But they're Christians. But Hefsurs are very distinct from any other Jew. Their dresses look like Roman togas. And there are some stories that they were participating in crusading warfare, the crusaders' folk. 
But in Chepsuret, you have a local pagan tradition that looks like Simchat Torah, for example. Uh, they are Christian Christians, but uh, uh, they have these traditions that they cannot explain it. They very much look like Jewish traditions. So, what happened? God knows. Can I ask you what was your first language, and was there ever a distinctive language that Georgian Jews spoke? It was Georgian. It was only Georgian, and. Um, in the region of Javacheti, uh, there was a very funny situation. You had, uh, it's a bordering with um, Armenia and Turkey. You had a population where uh, part of them were talking Turkish, part of them were talking Armenian, and part of them were talking Georgian. The only ones who spoke Georgian were Jews. <laughs> Georgian Jews. The yeah. others were speaking in other languages, even Greek. The Ashkenazim can't give up their Yiddish? No, they spoke their Yiddish, no problem. So we don't have a Ladino, we don't have Yiddish, we, don't, we have just Georgian language. Uh, yeah. But uh, actually, uh, what happened was very interesting. The Georgian Orthodox Church adopted uh, uh, liturgy songs from Hebrew songs. And there was a lot of debate that they are some, uh, somehow linked to Greek uh, Orthodox Church. No, none of them are. The Georgian Orthodox traditions are not that much linked to Greeks, but it's linked to Jerusalem. And in, uh, in the 19th century, a lot of Hebrew words that Jewish merchants were using uh, as uh, passwords, as uh, buzzwords, became into Georgian language as a slang. And Georgians today don't recognize that these are actually Jewish words. I'll tell you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> so at the back? Yeah. Um, you may have answered this before uh, I came, but um, the Jews, the Georgian Jews in Israel who identify and, and keep up their culture, are they religious or not so religious? They are very religious. Yeah. The Georgian Jews were always very uh, semi-religious, semi-traditionalists. Mm -hmm. But uh, they would always keep kashrut home. Uh, they would go and eat and drink outside. Mm -hmm. But home was always kept uh, kosher. They were religious. Um, I thought that Simchat Torah was the only Jewish language that was spoken in the Orthodox Church. The uh, they were Jews from the Pats and Persians, that we call the Mahmouds, and they have their specific religions. They do have very distinctive religions. The back? Ah. Oh. Yes, oh. yes. Um, I'm interested in the Jewish community in Israel, but I'm interested in the Israeli-Georgian relationship, and specifically touching on what you talked about earlier about um, Georgian communities having political influence. If the Jewish Georgian community in Israel um, was ever instrumental in lobbying for that security military relationship with Georgia, and then how they reacted when Israel cut that off? Uh, they reacted badly. There are a number of Georgian origin and peace um, in uh, Israel, but um, first one was a dry pool, I think. And now we have two or three one from Shas and one from other party, but they are largely party animals and not ethnic animals. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so they are more loyal to their party than the ethnic group. So they will always keep the party line. So um, Georgian Israeli relationships are somehow based on Georgian Jewish relationships, but uh, they are having their own dynamics. And I think that, uh, I personally think that Israel made a mistake when they cut uh, military supply to Georgia. Because uh, what they got is Russia continued to arm Saddam. That uh, is, uh, not Saddam, uh, what's this guy? Is it Syria? Assad. So uh, it 
didn't have to give in to Russians. They got the absolutely negative reaction. Okay, Georgian market is not just such a huge and important market, but it shows you that, you know, sometimes even Jews cannot be trusted. Uh, especially if they are politicians. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have time maybe for one more question. If not, I am going to come back to history and ask you about the Soviet period. So Joseph Stalin, a Georgian, was not exactly known as a philo -Semite. So are you really saying that even in the Soviet Republic of Georgia, there was much less official anti-Semitism than there was in the other parts of the Soviet Union? I'll tell you a story that not that many people know. And that uh, was discovered by uh, one of the Stalin's biographers. Apparently, uh, when Stalin was a young kid, uh, his father uh, was very ill, and his mother was um, uh, working as a servant or clinic lady or something like that. Apparently, she was working in a Georgian Jewish family. And head of the family, and he was taking little, that, that time he was so so, so, so right. <laughs> uh, with him. And that Georgian Jew was actually giving him books and money. Uh, later story goes that um, when that man went to visit Stalin, and he was reported that uh, there is one guy, you know, from Georgia, claim to know you, and he is asking for audience. He said, "Oh, that's my father." He referred to that guy as a father. But there is other explanation that he actually hated every day when his mother was working for Jews, and it was not about Georgiousness or uh, something with Georgia or the Soviet. It's a personality trauma. Because Stalin was a very complex personality. He was kicked out from divinity school. You know that he was in a religious school, uh, Orthodox. So his mother spent time in the Jewish family. And, um, and the story about, uh, this famous story about Jewish doctors goes that those doctors were not able to save him then his face is the, is it, is, uh, smallpox or something. And uh, there are actually the Jewish doctors that were not able to save him. So he, this childhood trauma reflected into the uh, Same way you now people say that why Putin is against uh, adoption. adoption of, uh, in America, because he was orphaned himself, and he was not adopted by Americans. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this has been a really very fascinating hour. I have Thank a book you. for you. Oh, you do? No, you because do actually, care. what's my last question was um, wonderful. What can we, how can we find out more about this? Well, thank you very much. We will have this in our library uh, in the Center for Eurasian and Refugees European Studies, and I'm looking forward to reading this. Thank you very much for coming, and since you're going to be in the area.